press star 3. That's star 3 on your keypad, and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press the Submit Question button, and your question will come directly to us. Stay with us through the hour, and you will learn useful tips to help you live well on your journey with diabetes. In addition, we invite you to provide us with your feedback in our five-question survey at the end of the event. Okay, now a little bit about why we're here today. Because of the link between diabetes and heart health, the American Diabetes Association, in collaboration with the American Heart Association, has launched No Diabetes by Heart. With support from founding sponsors, the Beringer, Ingelheim, and Eli Lilly and Company Diabetes Alliance, and Novo Nordisk, as well as national sponsors Santa Fe, AstraZeneca, and Bayer. The Know Your Diabetes by Heart initiative provides tools and resources for people living with type 2 diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of heart disease. As part of the initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A once a month. We'll cover information and tips to help you take charge of your health. The health and safety of all those we serve at the American Diabetes Association is our top priority. COVID-19 continues to be a public health threat. In general, people with diabetes who get COVID face greater challenges with maintaining glucose within target range. And if glucose levels have been elevated over time, they also have increased risks of complications when dealing with viral infections. And that is also true of COVID-19. The American Diabetes Association encourages persons with diabetes to get vaccinated. If you have questions about the vaccination, please talk to your health care provider. The ADA also encourages persons to follow the guidance of the CDC and to contact your medical provider if you suspect that you are showing symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19. For our most up-to-date information, please visit our website at diabetes.org forward slash coronavirus, or call 1-800-DIABETES, which is 1-800-342-2383. And now to begin our program. I'm delighted to introduce Gary Shiner as our expert today. Gary is owner and clinical director of Integrated Diabetes Services, a practice located just outside of Philadelphia, specializing in intensive insulin therapy and advanced education for children and adults. He consults via phone and video worldwide in his practice. He has been a certified diabetes educator for 25 years and has had type 1 diabetes for 36 years. Gary was named 2014 Diabetes Educator of the Year by the American Association of Diabetes Educators. He has written six books, including the bestseller, Think Like a Pancreas, A Practical Guide to Managing Diabetes with Insulin. He lectures nationally and internationally for people with diabetes, as well as professionals in the healthcare industry. Gary, do you want to add something to that? Well, I, I was diagnosed in a little town outside of Houston called Sugarland. People usually find that pretty interesting. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, thanks, Gary. As we're waiting for our callers and online listeners to chime in, I'm going to go ahead and kick off with the first question. Should diabetes limit people from traveling both nationally and internationally? Well, I would hope the answer to that is an obvious no. I mean, it's, it's, there's very little that diabetes should restrict people from doing. You know, there's a couple of occupations that you know, they don't allow people with diabetes, at least those who take insulin, to participate but you know, for the most part, people with diabetes can travel uh, on business, on pleasure, any place uh, for any reason, uh, as long as they have a few key insights to know how to take care of themselves when they do so. Great, and we'll be learning those today, I hope. So if you're just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts Q&A, Prepping for Travel with Diabetes. As a reminder, for those of you on the phone, press star three, that's star three, on your keypad and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask the question. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the stream player. Press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. 
Remember that today's topic is about traveling with diabetes. So let's focus on those on that topic for today's event. Now let's take the first question. So we are going to go to uh, Clarence. Clarence is from Atlanta. Clarence, you're on the phone. Oh, good afternoon. I'm calling to ask about the sleep with a diabetes patient. When a person travels, often they have difficulty sleeping in an unfamiliar bed and what have you. Is sleep that much more important for a diabetes patient than for any other person? And if so, what do you recommend a person like myself who's traveling and going to be sleeping in a strange bed that they can do so that they can get the proper amount of sleep? Uh, that's a it's a great question, Clarence. I got to ask first: Are you an Atlanta Falcons fan? <laughs> so oh, he's not on the gonna, line. I don't think we're going to get an answer to that. But yeah, I'm a I'm a diehard Eagles fan, so we had a we had a good opening week against them. But the question about about sleep, yes, yeah, sleep uh, does have effects on on glucose levels and on glucose control. So we should make efforts to try to maintain uh, quality sleep even when we travel. When sleep is too short or too long or is interrupted too frequently, it has effects on us hormonally, and, and that in turn can affect our glucose control. It can also affect things like appetite and energy levels. So trying to maintain as much routine as possible when you travel is beneficial. So uh, try to avoid eating very late at night because you know, that can interfere with quality sleep. Um, try to maintain a fairly steady level of physical activity, but you know, exercising very close to bedtime is, is never a good idea. Um, so, and, and controlling blood sugars when we travel also affects our sleep quality. So there's sort of a, a two-way relationship. You know, diabetes affects sleep and sleep affects diabetes. So managing glucose levels when we travel and, and overnight uh, will allow us to sleep better. Uh, high blood sugars while we sleep can keep us from getting into a deep phase of sleep where we get the best rest. And low blood sugars during the night can obviously cause us to, to waken and have a difficult time getting back to sleep. So you know, do, do pay attention to glucose levels when you're traveling in order to keep your sleep on track. Great. Thank you. We have a question now coming in from Lula, Lula from Iowa. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am on, I'm type 2 diabetic and I am on dialysis. And I have been afraid to travel because of the complications of lining up pay, uh, places to do my dialysis. Lula, it's definitely a, a reason to prepare and plan ahead of time. Usually dialysis centers have connections in other cities. There's a whole network of dialysis centers around the country. If you speak with the people at your dialysis center, you know, particularly the manager of the center, they can usually provide you with the contact information of where you're going to be staying so that you can continue your dialysis treatments. That's probably the best thing that you can do is, is again, plan ahead uh, at least, you know, try to at least several weeks ahead of time so that you can coordinate your treatments while you're on the road. Good advice. And remember, we are talking about diabetes and traveling when you're, when you're um, calling in. Um, I have an excellent question, and this is from Tom. Tom, uh, Tom is from uh, Pennsylvania. Hello, this is uh, this is Tom calling from the uh, the northern and western suburbs of Philadelphia, and uh, I would like to know what the most common problem is that people encounter in uh, with diabetes in international travel. Oh, Tom's a neighbor of mine. That, that's terrific. Um, see, a common problem, I, I would say the most common issue besides dealing with airport security, which everyone's having to deal with now, probably the most common problem is with low blood sugar. 
um, due to the increase in walking and, and physical activity. But I, I think it, it's it's also related to often reductions in stress levels. I've, I've had many patients who have to reduce their insulin and diabetes medications when they travel because their stress levels are so much lower, their blood sugars come down quite a bit. So preventing hypoglycemia again, is something you should plan to do before your trip. You know, talk with your, your diabetes doctor or your diabetes specialist uh, about adjustments that you can make either to your diet or to your medication program to safeguard you against experiencing low blood sugar when you travel. One other thing that can contribute to hypoglycemia during travel is altitude. And we may get into more detail about this later, but when you go from a low, a lower altitude to a high, much higher altitude, uh, the body's metabolism picks up, and that in turn causes glucose levels to drop a bit. Um, so you know, I'm I'm pretty close to sea level being in Philadelphia. Well, you know, Carla's in the mountains of Utah. You know, if, if I go to visit her, I'm going to have to cut my insulin back for a day or two to keep my blood sugar from going low. Great. We have a question coming in from Parveen. Parveen is from uh, California. Yes. Parveen, you're on the line. Yes, yes. Yeah, I travel internationally, and also I travel, in, you know, interstate. So I often noticed that, you know, I uh, my blood sugar goes like yo-yo. I don't know how to manage or control. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting very low and I don't get a chance to do the, my blood test. So, and when I get, see, when I check my low blood sugar, then I see it is very high. So if it will be helpful if I can manage, if I know how to manage, you know, my medicine and the food intake. I think that's something that many of us deal with when we travel. You know, there are changes in physical activity. Sometimes we're sitting more. Sometimes we're more active. Food intake is, is often challenging as well. We're not eating our usual meals and snacks at the usual times, which can create a, a, an additional challenge. A lot of the food that we eat when we travel has, has more fat content than what we eat at home. And that extra fat can affect not only absorption of the carbohydrates, uh, but also our body's sensitivity to insulin. You know, stress levels can bounce around a bit. Uh, most people find that the, the actual traveling process of getting to your destination can be wrought with a lot of extra stress, but once you get there, the stress levels are much lower than usual. Um, so again, it, it's, a, it's a matter of, of knowing your body, knowing how your body reacts to these different things, and practicing ahead of time, practicing how to handle meals that are delayed or meals that have more fat than usual, knowing how to make adjustments for different levels of physical activity, uh, understanding how stress is going to impact your blood sugar. And, you know, stress is interesting. That There are emotional stresses that send blood sugars very high, and then there are physical stresses like multitasking and running a lot. That, that can drive the sugars down. So, so really knowing how to handle those properly. Um, I always think of blood sugar control like a balancing act. And for everything that raises your glucose, you need something on the other side of the scale to lower it. You know, we have plenty of tools at our disposal. You know, besides insulin and medications, we have our food choices. We have physical activity. We, we have stress management techniques, and we can apply these to keep our glucose in range, even with all the challenges that travel can throw our way. So this is a situation where working with a diabetes care and education specialist can teach you a lot of this, the tricks and, and tips for managing in all these different situations. Great. We have a, a great question coming in from John. This is online, so I will ask it. I'm going on a cruise soon. I'm feeling guilty about all the bad food they're going to have and worried about my blood sugars, worried I won't be able to resist. What should I do? Well, Tom, uh, I'm joining the club because I'm taking a cruise with my family 
towards the end of December around the holidays, and, and I've taken cruises in the past, and my approach to this is it is a vacation, and I think on a vacation it's reasonable to allow yourself to enjoy yourself, and that's, that's the reason we go on vacation. I mean, I, I wouldn't go out of my way to eat unhealthy foods, but I think it's a time when we got to put our own mental well-being and personal enjoyment first and if, if your glucose levels slip a little bit yeah I, I think it's acceptable uh, personally we don't have to be on on our game a hundred percent of the time every day of the year if there's a handful of days where you're gonna just relax enjoy yourself and, and you know, have foods you you know might affect your blood sugars in, in a in negative way you know, so be it you always have a chance to get back on track when you're uh, back on va back from your vacation, I mean, if you're intent on managing yourself effectively even on the trip, what I do is I add some extra exercise every day when I am on vacation. I find that it balances out some of the unhealthy foods pretty well and helps keep my blood sugars from going much too high. Yeah, and I, and I think another thing is when you know there are some foods that you want to try that have a lot of carbohydrate value and may cause some escalation, just watching the portion um, and, and not eating them alone but having them with the, your main meal if possible. So if it's a dessert, maybe you just have the meat and vegetable and then the dessert and let the potatoes go. Um, so making choices or having less is also another way of adapting to that, I think. Um, so now we have a question coming in from Eileen. Eileen is from Pittsburgh. Boy, we got a lot of Pennsylvania people coming. Eileen. Good afternoon. Um, I am asking about a needle cutter. I have looked online and I found a particular one um, made by BD, which is small, easy to carry, because typically what I do is get a hard container, whether it be, you know, a screw with a screw off lid to put my needles in because not every place you go has a receptacle. And so I travel with them and bring them home. But I was looking for another alternative and found this. However, do you know any chain drugstore that carries them? I went online to get them and they're relative, I mean, they're really inexpensive. And the postage or the the delivery fee was actually three different sites, three times the cost of the product. So I have started to look in drugstores for them, but do you know a chain, like is there a Walgreens or a Rite Aid does, or, or a medical supply place that carries them? Yeah, the item you're describing is called the BD Safe Clip, and it is a really effective portable way to snap the needles off of both pen needles and syringes and I've seen it I've seen it in some national chain pharmacies uh, but you can also go online and probably find it and you know it, it doesn't cost much to ship one of those it's usually only a, it's a very small thing so it's only a few dollars but you have other options besides cutting or breaking the needles off of your pen needles and syringes uh, when I used to be on injections, I use a pump now, but on injections, when I had syringes, uh, I, I used to keep a, a toothbrush uh, container uh, with me. It's just a hard plastic container, and I would throw my old syringes in there so that I could throw them out. If you have an old glucagon kit that's expired, that, that's another. Any kind of hard shell, hard plastic case that'll fit those syringes you can use. And even if uh, you just have a, a pill bottle, a thick plastic pill bottle, you, you can pull the plunger out of your syringes and then the, the syringes with the needle will usually fit in those pill bottles. So, you know, th there's more than one way to solve that. Um, you know, just having a container you can throw those in and then dispose of it when you get home would work perfectly fine as well. Great. Thank you. Another question is, what about the amount of supplies you should take when you're traveling? Um, probably different nationally versus internationally, but could you address that? Yeah, that's a, it's a topic I, I discuss with almost all of my patients when they're planning to travel. 
uh, I think it's reasonable to bring double the supplies that you would normally need for any trip, you know, particularly if you're going to be traveling by air, as nothing will ruin a trip, uh, uh, whether it's a vacation or a business trip, than not having the diabetes supplies and equipment you need. It can really mess things up. So uh, I teach people who are traveling by air to pack enough supplies to last the length of their trip and put that in a carry-on bag and then make a duplicate set of everything and put it in their packed luggage. And that way they have, uh, they have a backup to fall back on. If something happens to one of those sets of supplies, you still have the other one that you can use. And that includes everything from you know, medications to batteries, you know, everything you might possibly need, glucose tablets, et cetera. Uh, you know, when you're traveling by, uh, by ground, by uh, car, by train, by bus, uh, you can obviously pack everything in one place, but I, I would still recommend bring twice as much as you think you're going to need. Uh, I read some articles recently about you know, people who were planning to travel and their trips were canceled because of computer glitches uh, with the airlines and with the train companies, and they ended up having to stay at their destination for upwards of a week more than they expected. So it, it's best follow that old Boy Scout, Girl Scout motto, be prepared. You want to be ready in case you have to spend twice as much time as you, you thought you would in, at, at your travel destination. Good. Thanks. Um, so we have a question coming in from um, Cheryl. Cheryl from Detroit. Hi. Can you hear me? Greetings. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Hi. Okay. Um, I have had some problems with TSA. I have a Dexcom, and you know the company says don't go through the scanner. So upon approaching, I always ask for a pat down, and it it doesn't seem to be a problem most of the time, but um, a lot of times they're constantly swiping the scanner, <laughs> and. And um, I was wondering what our rights are as far as anything with TSA, as far as our medication and any medical devices we have on us. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point to bring up. I guess there's a difference between you know, what's our legal rights and what's practical and going to work effectively for us. Uh, I can tell you that there are millions of, of times that people with diabetes have gone through security checkpoints, meaning either full body scanners or metal detectors with their diabetes devices on them. And there's really no record of damage being caused to the devices or malfunctions as a result of doing so. Uh, the best thing you can do is get yourself TSA PreCheck. TSA PreCheck makes it much easier for people with diabetes to get through security. Uh, you use a standard metal detector, which doesn't pick up on things like glucose sensors and insulin pumps. You can just walk right through without, without a hassle. Uh, if you can't get TSA PreCheck and you have to use a full body scanner, you can do so. You don't have to remove the, any of these devices when you go through. Just let the security people know that you're wearing diabetes devices on your body and point out where they are. And once you go through the full body scanner, then they're just going to scan your body and, and dust your, your, your hands for uh, any explosives. It takes all of 10 seconds, and then they send you on your way. Uh, but I, I don't think you really have to you know, start looking at legal grounds and things like that. Just focus on what's practical, what's going to get you through security as mm -hmm. quickly and as easily and painlessly as possible. And, and those, I find, are the best approaches. Great. Um, listeners, are you familiar with the Diabetes Self-Management Education Program? Diabetes Education Programs provide services that focus on your concerns about diabetes and will empower you with the knowledge and skills to manage it. And they link you to support resources in your community. You can find an ADA-approved program in your area by clicking on the Find a Program link on our webpage, diabetes.org forward slash experts. You can also call 1-800-DIABETES, that's 1-800-342-2383 to ask a member of our call center with assistance in identifying a program near you. 
And both Gary and I have worked in those programs and, and really, uh, I think, support them. Um, so uh, we have another question coming in that really isn't just about, it's not about travel, but I think it's a, a good one, Gary, for you to answer. And that's coming in from Gertrude, um, Gertrude from Brooklyn, New York. Okay, do you want me to uh, speak now? I think I, <laughs> at this point, um, my my question really is that on a daily basis, uh, I seem to get a different reading. And um, sometimes it's a good reading and sometimes it's not. And I I wanted to know why the readings would change. I've had medicine that changed. I've had um, changes made in terms of diet, and I still get readings that sometimes are good and sometimes are not good. They're high. And I'm, I've had my medication changed, and they're still one minute high, and then the next day it's slow. And I, I just can't find a way of having it be consistent. So that that's my biggest. Gertrude, you, you come from one of my favorite places. Um, I was born in Queens, and I, I like going biking around Brooklyn, one of my favorite places to ride. Uh, your question, it's a great one, uh, and I think everybody with diabetes can relate to what you're saying. We try to do the right things, and we may do the same thing two days in a row, and our glucose levels vary from day, one day to the next. And we kind of shrug our shoulders and shake our heads and say, well, it's just the diabetes gods out to get us. The fact is the devices we use to measure our glucose are not that precise. Uh, you might get a, a reading of 130 one day and 150 the next day when the glucose values are actually the same because these, these meters and sensors are just not as you know, accurate as a laboratory measurement would be. You also have to consider what's an allowable amount of change from one day to the next. I like to use the, the phrase in range, above target, and below target. That way it kind of takes judgment out. I never use you know, good, bad, and ugly to describe glucose levels. And if your glucose is within your acceptable range, let's say you and your doctor decide you know, you'd like your blood sugar to be somewhere between 80 and 150. You know, as long as it's pretty close to that range, there's you know, nothing much to be concerned about. But you know, if there's an enormous difference from day to day, you might look at some of the variables that are truly affecting your glucose level. You know, besides food and physical activity and your insulin and medications, you know, there's a number of other social factors that can come into play. Emotions have an effect. Uh, weight changes, moods. Uh, the weather <laughs> can affect our glucose. I mentioned before our sleep patterns can affect glucose. Carla, you can probably throw out a few more of the variables that have an impact on glucose levels, and we could talk all day about these. Any that come to mind, Carla? Well, you know, I think if we think about Adam Brown saying there's 42 variables and maybe 43, so I think there are a lot. Um, it's it's the mix of the food that you eat. You know, it's it, if you're going to eat something that's got carbohydrate in it and you don't add a protein or you add a protein in a fat or you, um, there there are just so many reasons for the ups and downs. But once again, it's hopefully most of the blood sugars will be in this target range, which internationally right now is 70 to 180. So somewhere in that ballpark um, on a regular basis. Yeah, and if the glucose changes by a few points, it's again, it's nothing to be concerned about. If there are very large differences, if you go from in range to much higher or much lower day to day to day, you know, then you might want to talk with your di diabetes team about some of the sources of that. Now, usually we can figure out, if we dig deep enough, we can figure it out. People sometimes don't realize caffeine can affect their glucose levels. Hydration can affect it. Mm -hmm. you know, there, are, there are so many variables. And you know, Adam Brown's, I, I think his 42 is a gross underestimate. If we really set our minds, we can come up with even more. Uh, but again, I, I wouldn't sweat it if it's just a, a minor change from day to day. Uh, but if you are having you know, major fluctuations, like 40, 50, 60 points from day to day, you know, that's probably worth troubleshooting. 
Yeah, that's great. So we have a question coming in from Glenn. Glenn from Nashville, Tennessee. Hello. Hey, Glenn. Hello. My my question is, when you're on the road, how good is it to transfer a prescription? Let's say if you start at Walgreens and then you go to a if I went to Philadelphia, if they don't have a Walgreens, if they have a CVS, if I could get something if I needed to. Most pharmacies have reciprocal relationships. I think it is a good idea to carry written or printed prescriptions with you when you travel, especially for things that might be life-saving for you. Uh, if you have a written prescription, you should be able to go to just about any pharmacy if there's an emergency and you run out or your, your supplies are lost somehow, your medications disappear. You can go to a pharmacy if you have a written prescription and get that filled. Uh, that, that's, your, I think, your best option. But just like I said before, if you have life-saving medications that you're taking with you on a trip, take twice as much as you think you're going to need and pack them, you know, split them in two separate places. So if one of your bags gets lost or stolen or confiscated, you've got the other to fall back on. Perfect. And I, I have I have made that same recommendation as you do, Gary, to uh, the people that I work with with diabetes, and I have had them come home very grateful because they have gone through almost everything <laughs> by the time they've had d different things happen. For example, a sensor falls off or um, their insulin gets too hot or they, as you mentioned before, have to stay longer. So I think that idea of carrying twice as much, particularly with international travel, is, is real critical. You know, the so one another time, question Carla, for you. Yeah. Let, let me interrupt yeah. for a second. The, the one time I didn't follow my own advice was for a quick trip I had to take from Philly up to Boston. It was supposed to be a one-day trip. It ended up being a few days more. And I only brought one vial of insulin with me. So what happened? I dropped that vial on the bathroom floor and it shattered. Luckily, yeah. I was at a meeting where almost everyone had diabetes, so I was able to borrow insulin. But you never know when that sort of thing can happen and where it could happen. Yeah. So yeah, play it safe. Bring twice as much as you're gonna need. Yeah. And for, for sure, look at if you're taking insulin, look at look at the vial of the pen and make sure there's still insulin in it. I was uh, at a camp for kids with diabetes, and one of the counselors uh, came and said, oh, I didn't realize there's nothing in my vial. I just brought the mm -hmm. vial, so uh, be aware of that as well. Um, don't forget that if you go to star three, the questions will come into us. So star three on your phone helps us um, and helps you get to us. Okay. So I have a question coming in from Richard. Richard is from Milwaukee. Uh, Richard. Richard, are you on the phone? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I plan on taking a road trip soon and the exercise that I do when I'm at home is generally after I eat not going to be convenient to exercise, you know, while driving. Uh, is there an optimum time for exercising relative to your eating time? It's a, it's a great question, Richard. Uh, exercising after meals is beneficial because it does help to knock down that post-meal blood sugar rise that most of us get. But if you take insulin at your meal times, you have to be very careful. Most people have to reduce that insulin dose by quite a bit, otherwise they, they wind up hypoglycemic. Uh, but you can easily exercise before or between meals. Uh, if you take insulin or you're taking a medication that can cause low blood sugar, you'll probably need to consume a little bit of carbohydrate before the workout. You know, depending on the length of the workout, you know, the average person might need, say, 15 grams of of carb for half an hour of exercise. You know, it varies depending on how big you are and how, how much exercise you're going to get, but it's a, it's a reasonable starting point. So if you're you know, an insulin user and you take basal and bolus insulin at meals, you can work out any time. You, know, you can always snack beforehand to prevent a low, 
or cut back on the insulin uh, if you're exercising after a meal. So um, here is a follow-up question. Um, where did it go? Oh, here it is. So this follow-up question from what you mentioned, Gary, about dropping your bottle is from Mrs. Uh, Lloyd from Brooklyn. Yes. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I, you know, the rule of thumb that I've heard over the years, and it took me a long time to um, – you know, get that in my head, but I got it as an adult. Um, they always tend to say, you know, not to share medicines. And what when I heard you mention about the fact that you had dropped yours and there was other people in the room happened to have been, you know, diabetic, um, you was able to, you know, get the, you know, the uh, medication you need. Is that safe to do? That, that, that's a great question, Mrs. Lloyd. Uh, when I if when you have a choice between not taking insulin and going into ketoacidosis or using someone else's insulin and trusting that it's going to be safe for you. I went with the choice of trusting someone else's insulin. Uh, I mean, in general, yes, it, it's smart to only use your own medications and it's best to not put yourself in a position where you have to borrow insulin or any medication from somebody else. Yeah, but when it's a, you know, a serious life or death type situation, uh, you know, you don't have much of a choice, so that's that's why I did that. You know, typically, I, he, he, this person gave me a vial of insulin that was unopened in the box, but honestly, if all they had was an open vial, I probably would have used that anyway. It's life-saving, and you have no other option. That is the option. So, so something to think option. about. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a question coming in from uh, Gary. Gary from Glendale, California. Hi there. Hey, Gary. I, yeah, my question was if you had something like, um, uh, I believe it's Omnipod, it's the, uh, oh, where, where it dispenses the, oh, I forget the what controller. it's called. The, the, yeah, where, where it dispenses the insulin. Yeah. Um, and if the controlling device, I believe they call, they call it the dash or whatever, what happens if that fails and you're on a trip? Well, guess what? That happened to me also. <laughs> I think if anything could go wrong, it's happened to me at some point. This was uh, on a trip to Chicago, and I was using the Omnipod uh, with the older programmer. They just called it a PDM. And I, I left it in the airport uh, at, in Philly. Uh, I got on the flight, got to my destination, looked for it. It wasn't there. Uh, a nice thing about the pod, as with any insulin pump, they'll, they'll continue delivering basal insulin uh, until the device wears out. And with the pods, they, they last for three days. So I didn't have to worry about getting my basal insulin. It was the mealtime insulin and the correction doses that I still needed. So I used, I always carry syringes with me and I had insulin. So I was able to give myself shots. Uh, I just contacted Insulet and they had a replacement PDM to me uh, first thing uh, the next morning. So, you know, the worst case scenario, you have to go, you know, almost a full day giving yourself injections at meal times. But it, it does bring to mind that one of the most important things a pump user can have with them wherever they go is an insulin syringe, just an empty insulin syringe. Because if the pump breaks, gets lost, if you don't have the remote control for it, or if your infusion site pulls out, you can always draw insulin, if not out of a vial, you can actually draw insulin out of the pump itself and inject it. So having an empty syringe just tucked away in your bag, in your backpack, wherever, uh, can can also be a lifesaver. Perfect. I, that's, I totally agree with that. Okay, here's a question from Yolanda from Washington, D.C. Go ahead, Yolanda. Yolanda, you're on the line. Yes, good afternoon. I'd like to ask about when traveling on the road by car. 
short of always bringing your own food with you, and when you're in the car, there's not a lot of choices on the road, what are some, other than fast food, what are some of your options? Well, first off, I'm sorry about the Redskins. Tough game Sunday. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do a fair amount of, of car travel, and I, I do bring some food with me, but I usually – uh, you know, go go to a restaurant of some kind uh, for most of my meals, and you know even in you know restaurants on the road, you can often find foods that are pretty good. One of my favorite places to go is called Ruby Tuesday because they have a really good salad bar, and I can you know pick and choose what I'm going to eat there. You know, as, as with most places, you don't have to go to a fast food place if you can go to a a sit-down place, you can order healthier foods off the menu or find some place with a salad bar where you can, you know, prepare, you know, pretty much what you like. And so it's just a matter of being smart about where you end up going. And honestly, even if you have to eat fast food once in a while, it's not going to kill you to, you know, eat it once in a while. I wouldn't make it a regular stop, but you know, if, if you have to stop for a meal just once in, once in a blue moon and have to eat fast food, you can also make smart choices there uh, mm -hmm. if you, you look carefully enough. Uh, and I think another thing is it, travel with a cooler with food in it, uh, things that you like. For example, I think string cheese is great. Um, you can have like some of those great almonds uh, to snack on if you choose that. You can have... Um, uh, fresh fruit. You could have the apples that that travel well. So I I think you can peanut butter is great or an almond butter if you're allergic to peanut butter. I mean I think there are some things that you could just pack in an ice chest, um, and then if you're staying in a hotel, you can just refill the ice chest with um, with ice as needed to keep it cool. So that's another thing that we've done a lot with traveling, and I think uh, works pretty well when you're traveling by car. Obviously, if you're traveling by plane, it's not as effective. And, yeah. and baby, those bags of baby carrots are also a oh, good thing to great. lunch on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So here's another question on traveling by car, and this comes in from Cheryl. Cheryl from Illinois. Hi, uh, my question is. When traveling mostly by car, what is the best way to store your extra pens or vials? Um, I know I usually take a cooler with an ice pack, but I didn't know if that was the best or proper way to do so. Second, I do have one other question. I'm a recent amputee, I'm still in a wheelchair, so I can't do much exercise. I'm waiting to get the prosthetic made so I could start walking again. But in the meantime, are there any exercises I could do in my wheelchair? All right. Thank, thanks for calling in, Cheryl. If you're up in Bears country, uh, the Bears used to have a quarterback named Jay Cutler who has type 1 diabetes, kind of a, a hero to a lot of people. Uh, you know, first off, physical activity in a wheelchair or a chair in general is doable. Uh, there's a, a set of exercise videos called armchair fitness. There's another one called chair dancing. So you can look these up online and you can get a pretty good cardiovascular workout without getting out of a chair. So you do have some good options. Uh, as far as the insulin and keeping it safe, keeping it from spoiling, generally speaking, insulin is safe at room temperature. I mean, you can get insulin up into like the 80-degree 80, 80 range, and it'll work perfectly fine for a month. So you, do not, you don't have to keep it in a special cooler when you're traveling. However, if you think the insulin might be exposed to higher temperatures up in the 90s, then it is a good idea to protect it uh, by either putting it in a cooler uh, or keeping it in a, there are these pouches called Frio pouches. And the Frios are designed to hold pens, vials, or pumps. And they keep the insulin relatively cool without having to use batteries or freeze anything. Uh, I would never leave insulin in a car uh, for any extended period of time because even on a comfortable day, even in the 50s or 60s, if the sun is, is beating down on a car, it can get pretty hot inside. 
Um, so uh, never leave insulin in a car. If you have to go into a restaurant or a hotel, bring your insulin with you. Don't leave it in your luggage in the car because it can go bad. Uh, but again, that's only when the temperature can get up uh, into the 90 degree range. Below that, the insulin should be okay for about a month. Great, thanks. Another question, can you get the same medications in other countries that are available in the U.S.? And do you need a prescription if you're traveling and you need to pick up some more medication, particularly internationally? I, I do work with a lot of patients in other countries. Uh, in North America, in Canada, in Central America, you can get pretty much any medication that you would get here, and usually having a prescription will suffice. When you travel overseas, when you're traveling Europe, Asia, Africa, and so on, the same medications may not be available. Um, so again, it, it speaks to the importance of bringing extra supplies, extra medications with you. Uh, just in case what you normally use is not available at your destination. Thanks. So we have a, a call in from Vicki. Vicki's from Los Angeles and she just wants to share some information uh, she's familiar with on the airlines. Vicki? Yes, I, I just want to remind everybody when you go on your trip, see your doctor before you go, have them write a prescription for you and stating on it that you're going to be traveling have the prescription, you know, with you should any emergency happen. But also, as you tell the airlines or the boat shippers that you're going, that you have diabetes, because then if they, uh, if you have a room, say, on a boat that doesn't have a uh, refrigerator, they'll make sure that you have a refrigerator. So think out everything that you're doing, talk to your doctor, and you'll get all the documents that you need to protect yourselves and, you know, write and, uh, you know, carry things. Remember that you also are at risk because you're excited and somewhere new to have your glucose that you might need in an emergency, and that might include an injectable glucose. So have a great trip, but sit down before you go and think about, Oh my goodness, what happened, you know, in your own life where you had a problem so you won't have that problem again? Well, Vicky, thanks. That that's great advice. And two things you mentioned in your discussion I, I want to reiterate. One is uh the, the refrigerator. Just about any hotel, cruise line, any place you'll be sleeping should be able to equip you with a with a refrigerator and often it's it's free. And, you know, just ask for that when you make your reservation or check in. And when you set the fridge up, make sure it's not set for the coldest setting because you don't want your insulin to freeze. And sometimes those things by default are set much too cold. The other thing I wanted to touch on, you mentioned having, inject, having glucagon. Uh, anyone who takes insulin, anyone who takes uh, gliburide or glipizide, anything that can cause hypoglycemia, needs to be prepared when they travel. And it's not so much that you have to be prepared, but your partner that you're traveling with needs to be prepared. Because we're not on our usual schedules when we're traveling and our activity levels vary a lot, the risk of severe low blood sugar is higher when we travel than when we're at home. And the only and best way to handle severe hypoglycemia is glucagon. So if you're not able to consciously eat or drink something, your travel partner needs to be able to administer glucagon to you. Trying to feed you things when you can't consciously swallow could cause you to choke and suffocate, so glucagon needs to be used. And we have new versions of glucagon that make it a thousand times easier for them to give the glucagon to you. We have an inha a nasal glucagon called Baxemi. Well, all they do is stick this thing in your nostril and hit a button, and you've got your glucagon. It sprays right through the nasal passages right to the bloodstream. And there's also a, an injectable version called Gvoke that almost looks like an EpiPen. You never even see a needle. It, you just pop this thing on the skin, you count to five, and the glucagon's been already given. So the Gvoke and the Baxemi are new and much better versions of glucagon and make it easier for a partner to administer it if you're in a, in a crisis state. 
Carly, you have any additional comments about that? No, good good information and totally true. I mean, the, the other thing is, of course, for people that just have mild hypoglycemia should be aware of just having some form of glucose available. Um, and glucose tabs, even though they're not anybody's favorite, um, they don't ever get too hot and they never get too cold and they don't melt in the car. So it's, those are an easy thing to have uh, in case there is a, a low blood sugar or somebody's feeling kind of low uh, without severe lows. I think those things um, are designed have, to survive yeah. volcanoes and ice ages. Glucose tablets are yeah. indestructible. You know, and I always used to say the good part about them is no one eats them like candy because we give. <laughs> I work in a pediatric practice, and so you know, it's not like they down them because they want to eat them. But I, I have to laugh because I had a little guy that had a low at school, and I said, "Well, where were your glucose tabs?" He said, "I sold them, twenty-five cents oh. a piece." So if somebody really wants to eat them. <laughs> uh, you never know. Okay, so we have an interesting question coming in from Laura, and it's about Laura's sister. Hello? Hi, Laura. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say I have a sister who has type 2 diabetes. She's had it for about five or six years now. And as a matter of fact, she lost her big toe to an infection about about three years ago. And she loves to travel, and she's been traveling even with the, when, after she lost the big toe. But recently, the area has consistently become infected. So she hasn't been able to exercise or travel like she, used, like she, like, like she loves to do. And now she's, been, she's had the problem for over a year. And, I, and there's a nurse that comes by her house and changes the infected area once a week. I just want to know what can she do? What advice can I give her that would help her? Well, I think the best advice you can give her is to listen to her surgeon. You know, she probably needs to be non-weight bearing. I mean, you have to verify this with her doctor, but if they tell her she has to stay off of it, she has to stay off of it. Um, if they tell her she can be on it for short periods of time, then okay, she can be on it for short periods of time. But if she wants to travel, she can do so. She, must just, she just might have to use uh, an assistive device to be able to get around without putting pressure on that foot. Because, you know, when you lose a toe, your chances of losing the other toes goes up 1,000%. Your chances of losing your foot goes up 1,000%. So she's got to be really careful with it. I think the idea of some kind of assisted device it, that shouldn't, keep her from being able to go anywhere. We just need to learn what those things are and talking to her physical therapist or her doctor or the nurse that comes visits may be, may be a good way to figure out what those are. So, so Gary, one of the questions that came in um, was part of a question to be asked but wasn't asked was, could you explain for people the difference between type 1 and type 2? I, I think that's confusing. And then the other question was, are there other kinds of diabetes? Um, so if you could answer that, that would be great. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, the type 1 and the type 2, the only thing they really have in common is they both involve uncontrolled glucose levels. But other than that, they are very, very different conditions. You know, type 1 diabetes develops because the pancreas loses the ability to produce any insulin. And that is caused by the immune system attacking the pancreas. So it's, it's called an autoimmune disease. With type 2 diabetes, the pancreas can still produce insulin. In fact, it often produces more insulin than it's supposed to. The problem is that the body's cells are unable to use that insulin properly to lower the blood sugar levels. And we refer to this as a state of insulin resistance. Now, over time, over many years, the pancreas may wear down and not make as much insulin as it used to, but ultimately type 2 diabetes is caused by insulin resistance. Type 1 diabetes is caused by an attack on the pancreas that destroys the cells that make insulin. So that's the difference. Now, someone with type 2 diabetes might need medications to treat it. They might need injectables. They may even need insulin injections to treat it. That does not mean they have type 1. It just means they have type 2 that's treated with insulin or with other injectables. So it's really defined based on what caused it, not based on what's used to treat it. And yeah, there are other forms of diabetes 
Uh, there is gestational diabetes, which is it's sort of like type 2 in that it, it involves insulin resistance, but it happens specifically during pregnancy. And it tends to go away, at least for a while, after the pregnancy is over. So that, that we refer to as gestational. Uh, there are a few other forms. One is called LADA, one is called MODI, and these are more or less incomplete, incomplete forms of either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. They're much less common than type 1 and type 2, but they do exist. And there are other genetic uh, forms of diabetes that develop where glucose levels rise for a variety of different reasons, but you know, type one and type two makes up you know, probably 99% of what we see. Thank you. Um, if you could use support throughout the year, there's a few resources you might want to check out. One is Living with Type Two Diabetes program, where participants receive information through email and e-booklets that provide support and information on emotional health, eating healthy, and physical fitness. Tips on managing and living well with type 2 diabetes, as well as opportunities for support online and in your community. The link to sign up is on our registration page, diabetes.org forward slash experts. Okay, um, one more question and then we're going to have to close. How do you change medication dosing if you're changing time zones? And does it matter if you're going to just be gone for a couple days versus a few weeks? question. It really depends on the type of medication or type of insulin that you're using. With some of them, it, it is important to stay on a 24-hour cycle with your medications, and only your doctor can tell you. It really depends on, on the specific medications that you use. But if you need to take something on a regular 24-hour cycle, then when you travel across time zones, you may need to take it at a different time when you get to your location. So for example, if, if I am taking an insulin that lasts 24 hours and I travel to California where it's three hours earlier, I'm gonna have to take my insulin three hour, at, at three hours later than usual when I get to my destination because 8 p.m. here is 5, 5 p.m. in California. So I would end up taking my insulin at eight, at, five o'clock in California to match 8 p.m. where I'm coming from. But again, a lot of diabetes medications can't, don't have to be taken exactly 24 hours apart. There can be some leeway a few hours either way. So you just ask your doctor about that uh, before your trip. Thanks. This wraps up our last question for the session. A few items before we close for today. Gary, could you give us three key takeaway points that you want to be sure our listeners take home from today's discussion? Well, first is plan ahead. Uh, you know, don't think about your diabetes the day before your trip. You know, at least take a few weeks ahead of, ahead of time to make sure you have the supplies that you need, all the equipment, the prescriptions, you know, and, and a plan for handling uh, any emergencies or crises that come up. I think that's that's a biggie. Uh, the second is to try to maintain as much quote unquote normalcy as you can as far as your physical activity levels, your meal schedule, and so on. It's not always possible or even desirable to do that when you travel, but the more normalcy you can have, the easier it is to manage your diabetes. And third, if you're taking a pleasure vacation, uh, Take that vacation. Enjoy yourself. If you know, diabetes is not the beginning and end of everything, if your glucose control suffers for a few days, so be it. Uh, you know, go ahead and have some fun and do some things you like to do and, and enjoy your vacation. Thank you. Consider staying online or on the phone to complete a short five-question survey at the end of our um, meeting. To help you feel confident about your ability to manage your diabetes and heart health, we encourage you and your loved ones to talk to your doctor and dietitian about your risk. Go to nodiabetesbyheart.org and learn more. Register for the next event at diabetes.org forward slash experts. Sign up for a diabetes education near you. And sign up for ADA's free Living with Type 2 Diabetes program. Links to these resources can be found on our registration page, diabetes.org forward slash experts. Thank you for all your great questions you called and wrote in with. We're sorry we're unable to get to all of them during our live Q&A. 
If you have questions about this event, you are welcome to contact us at ASKADA, so that's AskADA, at diabetes.org, or by calling 1-800-342-2383. Driving with Diabetes takes a village, and we're here to support you. Special thanks to our expert, Gary Shiner. I am Carla Cox, and on behalf of the ADA team, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to connecting with you at our next Ask the Experts event, November 9, Finding Support from a Diabetes Educator, and on December 14, Navigating Holiday Stress. And now, please stay online for a short survey. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your feedback on today's event. To provide your responses, press the corresponding number on the keypad of your phone. For participants online, please click on the poll section below the Ask the Question form and click to submit your response. Okay, so here's our first question. Overall, how satisfied were you with today's event? Prepping for travel with diabetes. Use a scale from one to five, and one being not satisfied, and five being satisfied. I'll repeat that question one more time. Overall, how satisfied were you with today's event, prepping for travel with diabetes? Use a scale from one to five, with one being not at all satisfied, and five being very satisfied. While well, we take a moment for the next question to come up, I'd like to remind you about one of our programs supporting people living with type 2. I'd like to draw your attention to a resource the ADA has for diabetes-friendly recipes called Diabetes Food Hub. Go to diabetesfoodhub.org to find and search for recipes to try, learn about nutrition, and sign up for a newsletter to receive regular tips for managing your diabetes with food. Again, that's diabetesfoodhub.org. Okay. Now for our next question. Number two, which of the following should be considered when traveling with diabetes? Press one for have all medications and carry them on your person if traveling by plane or train. Press two for include all glucose checking supplies and take twice as many as you think you will need. Press three for have treatments for low glucose on your person per your treatment plan. Or press four for all of the above. I will repeat that question. Which of the following should be considered when traveling with diabetes? Press one mm-hmm. for have all medications and carry them on your person if traveling by plane or train. Press two for include all glucose checking supplies and take twice as much as you think you will need. Press three for have treatments for low glucose on your person per your tra- treatment plan. And press or press four for all of the above. Before we go on to question three, we would like to let you know that if you missed a part of today's event or would like to just listen again, we now have full recordings available on our website. Go to diabetes.org forward slash experts and click on the past recordings from all previous calls. Here is question three. Which of the following statements is true? Press one. For when you have diabetes, you should not travel internationally. Press two for insulin is available in all countries so you do not have to take extra. Press three for take just the amount of medication and monitoring supplies you need to minimize the weight you have to carry. And press four for be prepared with twice the amount of medications and monitoring supplies that you need to avoid any potential interruptions in care. Question three again, which of the following statements is true? Press one, for when you have diabetes, you should not travel internationally. Press two, for insulin is available in all countries, so you do not have to take extra. Press three, for take just the amount of medication and monitoring supplies you need to minimize the weight you have to carry. And press four, for be prepared with twice the amount of medication and monitoring supplies that you need to avoid any potential interruption in care. Before we move on to the next question, we would like to remind you again that our next Ask the Expert event is November 9. This will be looking for your diabetes educator. This event will be hosted um, in the same format. Okay, now to question four. 
As a result of this event, how likely are you to schedule a visit with your healthcare provider to talk about the link between heart disease and diabetes? Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. I'll repeat that question. Number four, as a result of this event, how likely are you to schedule a visit with your healthcare provider to talk about the link between heart disease and diabetes? Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. While we await the final question, remember that a diabetes self-management education and support program will focus on your concerns about diabetes. The program will help to empower you with the knowledge and skills to help you manage your diabetes. A link to find an ADA-recognized diabetes education program can be found at the bottom of our Ask the Experts webpage, diabetes.org forward slash experts. Or you can speak to a member of our call center at 1-800-342-2383. Okay, here's our final question. Question number five. As a result of this event, how likely are you to sign up for our, or to continue to participate in a diabetes self-management education program? Remember, diabetes education programs usually require a referral from a healthcare provider. Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. Again, our final question, number five. As a result of this event, how likely are you to sign up for or continue to participate in a diabetes self-management education program? Remember, diabetes education programs usually require a referral from a healthcare provider. Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely,